Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, a 2020 survey of admission leaders, a mess of a year by Scott Jasek of Inside Higher Ed. Mark and Nika will discuss how does a school's endowment impact your education and what you have to pay? Our question from a listener is, how do colleges look at high school seniors enrolled in dual credit programs? And our interview is the final part with Sam Prouty on Understanding Middlebury College. And our college spotlight will be his discussion of Middlebury College. Okay, friends, a few weeks ago, we talked about test-blind admissions, but I cannot believe how much that process is accelerating at so many colleges. So this week, I attended a counselor program, Zoom video, of course, not live, with six highly selective small colleges, Carleton in Minnesota, Williams and Amherst, in Massachusetts, Bowdoin in Maine, Swarthmore in Pennsylvania, and Pomona in California. And these colleges were talking about how they're going test optional this year. Isn't that great for your students? And the counselors were saying, why are you not going test blind? And they were on defense. I couldn't (laughs) believe it. Yale has decided to go test blind for subject tests. And maybe even more surprising than that, although that's quite surprising because Yale's always loved their subject test, Harvey Mudd, which was one of the last three schools in the country, not make subject tests a requirement, now is going test blind, not optional, blind for subject tests. It was less than a year ago, probably just six months ago, they went test optional. Now they're test blind. And if you think that's just it, okay, now I'm going to talk about schools for the SAT or ACT, not subject tests. Reed is going test blind for two years. Caltech is doing a two-year trial on going test blind. Catholic University is going test blind. And many, many programs at Cornell Cornell University. At Cornell, you apply into colleges. So there are programs for agriculture, architecture, finance, hotel administration, all going test blind. It's part of a one-year pilot. CUNY system in New York, 11 campuses, all 11 campuses doing a one-year pilot on test blind. And of course, I'm not going to mention a lot of the schools that I mentioned the last time we did this, but a few others, Northern Michigan's going test blind and University of Minnesota, Crookston. So the test blind movement is picking up speed. The FAFSA and the CSS profile both opened up October 1st. I'll be sharing some great resources over the next few weeks to help you in completing those. And we have some great resources on our website already. Now, there's so many things that I just feel so much passion for that I can't wait to share with you guys that from episodes 145 to 150, six weeks in a row, I'm going to have bonus content during the question time. And I'm just going to share some things that I can't wait every five weeks to share because There's a hole burning through my heart. Dave, I got to get it off of me. (laughs) Preach it, brother. You got to preach it. (laughs) Also, if you like how I sort of share with you when I meet with some of these admissions leaders, some insights, shoot us an email at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. I'm thinking about doing that more often where I take insights back from when I meet with the colleges and share them with you. Now, something happened an hour ago, Dave. This was funny. And I and I was doing a session with a client in Weston, Florida, which is just outside of Miami. And and a, a client said something, and I said, "Can I share this on a podcast recording?" And they said, "Sure." So I was talking with a student and a dad, and I said to them, "You really can boil the whole college process, admission process, down into two words. Take a guess what those two words are." So, Dave, what do you think the dad said? Two words. Okay. If I'm a dad going back a couple of years, two words. Um, 
High stress. <laughs> hey, that was, that, was a, that was a great guess, my friend. <laughs> well, the dad, his name is George. He said, feel free to use my name. He actually uh, didn't follow my two words. He probably doubled it. And he said, show me the money. <laughs> show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning I'm about to cut a really big check right now. <laughs> I understand. I understand. That one, I, I was just cracking up. Yeah. All right. Missions tip. A lot of colleges, and, you know, they do something when they're evaluating an applicant. The applicants don't necessarily know this. They look at an applicant and they ask themselves, what can this student take away from our community? Yes. And that's one of the things they're looking at. Is this somebody who's going to maximize what we have to offer? So if you know that, then it's incumbent on you to communicate in the written part of your application or an interview what it is that you will get from the school's community. Right. So that's my tip. Make sure you're communicating what you feel that community will uniquely provide for you. And drum roll, please. Admissions vernacular. Dave's in the Virgin <laughs> Islands right now. Maybe the Virgin uh-huh. Islands. Maybe the Virgin Islands will help his luck a little bit. We'll see. <laughs> so 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 you know what I'm gonna ask you? Do I go? elementary, middle school, high school, grad school? What level of co- question do you want, Dave? I'm ready for the grad school, man. Bring it on. Bring grad it on. school. Okay. <laughs> the, and this is something that is commonly talked about amongst admission officers inside vocab. LTE. What is LTE? LTE. Uh, LTE. Um, boy. Okay, come on. You want to grad school, man, Mr. Virgin <laughs> Islands? I, I, chilling out. Ca- for, start pushing a hotel, then they can give you an apartment, give you a <laughs> sweet car. I'm calling Anika. Where are you, Anika? <laughs> Wake up, dear. I need you. I think you. that one ran out like six weeks ago. <laughs> well, Anika's not working. <laughs> LTE. Okay, wait, wait. LTE. Um, okay, I you got no three idea. seconds. One, two, three. Uh, 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 LTE stands for likelihood to enroll. Oh, man, I should have got that. And I will say this. I've said before, probably the single biggest thing I learned in the one year I did college admissions and the nine years I did boarding school admissions was how much we look for people like ourselves and we all bring biases to the table. Probably the second biggest thing, or certainly one of the top three or four things that I think the public doesn't understand is how much admission officers talk about whether or not they think this kid will come. Do we think this kid will come? This kid likely to enroll. LTE. And it can make a big difference whether you get in or whether you get waitlisted. That's right. It's like that online dating, man. It's like you can't shoot for the stars because it's like, what's the chance that they're going to Respond to me if I choose them. You know, I understand. I hope you're not doing any online dating there. There no, in the British no, Virgin no, Islands. No. Virgin no. Islands. <laughs> uh-uh. Not let Frida no. <laughs> just send the episode to Frida. I uh, know you're going to have to cut that one out of the eye. Fine, let it there. <laughs> Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right, let's start with our article. A good one by Scott Jasek, a name we've heard before in a great magazine, Inside Higher Ed. 2020 survey of admission leaders, a mess of a year. So this was a 2020 survey conducted by Inside Higher Education in conjunction with Gallup, the famous Gallup organization, done between August 6th and 30th of this year in which they surveyed 433 senior admission officials, only one per institution, so 433 institutions. And they found some pretty significant things. So what I'd like to do is talk about these six points, throw them out there, Mark, and then let's discuss. Sounds good? Yeah, let's go one by one. One by Um, one. And I just want to concur with Dave. So this was a good article in the sense that it's meaty. And I think every one of our listeners is going to learn things from it, and it's revealing. You know, a lot of times we talk about how higher ed is in trouble. Uh, where's the beef? Well, you're going to hear the beef. 
So it's a good article in that there's ample proof in those statistics we're going to share that higher ed is in some serious, serious trouble. But it's not good in the sense that it's kind of depressing. But yeah. it is what it is. So let's go through and let's talk about the talk about the day today. If you want to read the first one and introduce it. So here's six points. Point number one, this survey found that a record number of schools and institutions are concerned about filling their classes. Yeah. And and here's the thing. The nice thing about Inside Higher Ed is that they've been doing this annual partnership with Gallup for multiple years now. And what they're doing is they're really developing longitudinal data. So, for example, um, if you go three years back, they found that the number of people that were concerned about filling their class, it ranged between 46 to 51 percent, depending on what type of institution they were talking about. And then last year, it was 54 or 55 percent. And that those numbers were alarming then, like 54 to 50, 55 percent are very concerned about filling their class. Well, it's worse. This year's survey, six in 10 admission officials said they're very concerned, not just concerned, because they tested concerned versus very, very concerned about meeting their institutional goals for the fall. And then another 30% said they were concerned. So literally 90% of these 433 institutions said they're concerned about meeting their, meeting their admissions goals. And remember, very few schools have Princeton-type endowments. Right. So schools rely on enrollment as a way of funding their entire operation. Nine, not more than 99% of schools do. So 90% of schools are concerned, 60% very concerned. And for community colleges, that number was 69% very concerned. Right. This uh, relates to point number two, Mark, that a majority of colleges, also a record, not only did not fill their classes by May 1st, but did not fill them even by July 1st. This is scary, Dave, because it wasn't long ago where, uh, you know, May 1st was the day for most schools. Like, so May 1st is considered National Candidate Reply Day. If you apply regular admission, um, you need to make, or even early action, um, you need to make a decision on that day, decision day. And it is true that slightly more selective schools have have been the ones historically that have been able to fill their class off of May 1. They do enough research based on their past institutional history of how many students they need to admit. It's based on voluminous amounts of of data that they have, knowing what their yield will be. Remember, the yield is the percentage of accepted students that accept the offer. They have all that data, and they kind of know. I mean, I was just looking at this data recently for Emory. I mean, Emory um, gets 18.9% of their kids they admit in regular enroll and Davidson is 22.3%. So they have that statistical data. So they know we got to accept four and a half to get one or five to get one. And they know all that. So they just accept five times as many spots as they need to get one. Well, in this study, 26% wow. of colleges were filled by May 1st. Wow. And what makes it worse is the last couple of years, May 1st has been creeping to June 1st yeah. in terms of when schools would fill. But now, by July 1st, 60 days later, 56% of schools were still not full. So, literally, the majority of the schools are either filling up in July or August, or they're not filling up at all. Scary. Wow. Now, point number three dovetails with this beautifully, because you would expect that schools aren't filling. And, Mark, I know you're going to talk about this next point, because you actually had a special uh, emergency podcast about this rule change. And that's number three, a significant minority of private colleges took advantage of the recent NACAC rule changes to recruit students. And I think, what did you call it, Mark? It was going to be a a Armageddon or a... um, Something like that. Yes. But why don't you expand on what NACAC is and what those rule changes are and and why yeah. you literally called it and predicted it. Yeah, so the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, acronym NACAC, it does a number of things. It's an organization for professionals in the counseling field. I'm a member of NACAC, you know, personally. But it's also a governing body that governs rules and regulations and policies of good practice for the, you know, for, for colleges and for counseling practices. So it's all of those. And um, the organization was being pressured by 
the Justice Department to change a longstanding policy that said that once a student was enrolled, you could not go after them. It was a good faith agreement to protect the whole scene from being a complete free-for-all. And so now you, a student could always reach out to you. So let's say, for example, Lauren was at, enrolled at Yale and then she, you know, she decided, oh, I might want to go back and look at some of those schools that, that I, you know, had originally was interested in. So she could do that if she took the initiative and you could respond. But you couldn't go after somebody once they submitted an enrollment contract somewhere else. And the Justice Department was filing a class action lawsuit you know, saying that that was hindering competition and hindering individual freedom. And that might, a lot of people think, well, that kind of sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? But no, because it leads for complete free fraud. I was thinking about this example before we came on today, Dave. Yeah. This is how I see this. It would be like a a state or even the country saying, you know what? We're going to make divorces so easy because you should have more freedom that all you need to do is walk into any Walmart, 7-Eleven, Walgreens, CVS, and sign something in five seconds and you're divorced. Wow. Well, well, yeah, you'd be, in effect, giving people more freedom, but that's not necessarily good for society. Right. And so, that, anyway, that, that's the best example I could come up with. If Anika was here, she'd probably give me a two out of ten on that one, but one out of ten, but it, it is <laughs> what it is. It's the best I can do. And so, this just happened last October, and the question is always going to be, well, how many colleges are going to take advantage of it? Well, it wasn't long after these policies were enacted and we started hearing about changes that were happening. High Point in North Carolina was the first one. It, it involved a few other things. Not only could you not recruit from people that were enrolled other places, you also in the in the past could not overly incentivize people to apply early decision right. as well. Um, so they changed that policy so you could throw all kinds of special perks at people to make them apply ED. But there were some in the profession that thought, well, you know, just because it's changed on paper, it doesn't mean that there, anybody's going to implement it. Um, but what this study goes on to say is that more people are taking advantage of it. So let me read a little bit about what it says here. It says, but the pandemic has led people to change their views after previously saying that they wouldn't change. Nearly a quarter, 23% of colleges said that they are going to be offering new incentives to people to apply early decision. And then when asked, why did you change your view? The response was simple. Enrollment numbers have decreased. We have to do something. Well, yeah, you predicted it. And there were many who felt that these changes put the power back in the hands of the students, and it didn't. But what you predicted is what happened. It drastically increases institutional instability because the longer it takes for you to figure out what's in your class, the longer it takes you to figure out what resources you're going to need in terms of faculty, in terms of dorms and so forth. It makes it almost impossible to plan for the school year when you don't even know whether you'll be serving a thousand students or 1200 students or 800 students. And uh, so without the ability to budget, uh, you can't eff- effectively cope with a lot of the changes that are going on uh, economically with these schools as well. So, yeah, it's very serious. And I'll take it a step further, Dave. It's not only over the summer yeah. between May and, and August. I was talking to a very highly selective school, very prestigious school with a very high student satisfaction rate. And a senior admissions person said, Mark, I'm concerned about how this is going to impact us in September and October. When you've got someone who's away from home for the first time, maybe they're not getting along with their roommate, maybe they're homesick, and a co- another college that they applied to but didn't get down throws seven or ten grand at them and says, come our way, yep. we, you know? And, and so even when you think people are enrolled, um, you catch that person that's, you know, having a difficult time transitioning and in a, in a moment of weakness and throw some money at them, they might pick up and bail. So... This goes beyond just over the summer. This impacts even going after fall at MITS. Yeah. Well, we'll continue uh, because all these points are interrelated. Point number four, most colleges expect enrollments to decrease this year. Makes sense. Yeah, this one's scary because what the study does, it breaks colleges down in four categories. 
public universities that offer degrees all the way to the doctoral level. So that's going to be a lot of flagships, but also some regional some regional publics have doctoral degrees. Then it has public master's bachelors. So these are public institutions that would not have terminal degrees, but they generally have a lot of bachelors and some master's degrees. Community colleges is the third category. And then private colleges, doctoral and master, master. So those are the ones that they focused on in here. And, you know, they didn't do liberal arts colleges in here, but in the past, liberal arts colleges and community colleges have been the two that have been struggling the most in past studies that they've done. And now with this particular question just asked, it says, do you expect your enrollment to decrease or increase? And once again, this is very scary. So these, I'll tell you the percentage of people by degree type that expect it to be lower. So in the public doctoral category, 48% of respondents said that they expect it to decrease. Um, and, and they gave options. It could be less than 5%, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, or more than 15. So 48%. So almost wow. you know one in two expect a decrease. When you go to the public master's bachelor's category, it was 58% are expecting a decrease in enrollment, either five less than five, five to 10, 10 to 15, or greater than 15. And 3% of those, it was greater than 15, which is a huge hit on your budget. Right. The private doctoral category, once again, more than 50% in this category, 59% expect a decrease. And 13% think that de that decrease would be 10 to 15%. Another 5% think it will be more than 15. So 18% are expecting a decrease in enrollment by more than 10%. And then worst of all is the community colleges. Man, are they in trouble. Yeah. The community colleges, this number is just, just staggering. 74%, so three quarters, expect a decrease in enrollment. And here's a stunning number, Dave. 39% yeah. of that 74 expect a decrease by more than 10%. Oh, wow. So wow. there's a lot of pessimism about the future. Right. Now, do you think, you know, I was I was mulling that community college number, and it did occur to me that many of community colleges uh, cater to the vocational student who are taking a course that may not be amenable so much to online. I'm, I'm thinking about automotive. I'm thinking about mechanical. I'm thinking about even... Uh, nursing assistants or uh, medical fields where it's very hands-on. Do you think that's the way, why they're getting hurt so badly? Or do you think it's purely socioeconomic that a lot of the, uh, because so many people are, are under stress, particularly low, you know, the working class, that a lot of people just can't afford it? I think it's the latter because yeah. remember, there is also a differentiation between community college and technical schools. Right. Those are different. And yeah. so most of the times community colleges are two-year feeders into four-year programs or they have two-year programs of their own. Right. Um, but the more technically oriented, you know, vocations tends to be technical schools, vocational schools. Right. But I think it's more just financial. Right. And, you know, the, the most under-resourced families are the ones that are feeling the effects of COVID and the economy and everything. And so they don't have that extra, you know, bit of money, or maybe they're having to work three jobs so that the thought of going back to school when you're working three jobs or even two jobs or two or three kids at home, you know, is just sort of unfathomable. Like they sort of have to put that on hold right now. now and I, I haven't do, seen research on that, right. but that's my theory, Dave. Well, you know, and it does sales with a lot of articles I've been re writing how this COVID. Oh, now you're really writing. I'm reading, <laughs> reading, reading, sorry. Talk about reading. skills you're hiding from us, man. <laughs> I don't know, reading, sorry. You're already an emergency oh. doc and, uh, and, a, and a realtor, a building property operator and no, no, husband and a million other things. I'm a writer. Well, I wish. But, you know, this, this pandemic has really accentuated the gap between rich and poor. And they made the illustration that it's nothing for a high-income family to think about having two or three kids great internet access, all working from home, each having their own laptop. But but many families, even if they do happen to have internet service, it, it's substandard, and they may only have one computer to share among multiple kids or family members. So, you know, when uh, all of a sudden the community college says you have to do this online, just the additional cost of spending another $30, $40 a month for internet access 
and $500 for a computer may be the tipping point, which makes them decide not this year, can't afford it. And another thing to go along with that, Dave, is uh, what's there's a term, you know, oh, non-essential workers. Yeah. So more under resourced, you know, uh, families are non-essential workers. You know, they're like have to be at the Walmart line or whatever. That's correct. And so now that your kid's at home, it makes it extremely difficult. How are you managing the process of your kid learning from home? when You don't have the kind of job where you can work from home. A study came out recently that showed there's a very, very high correlation between jobs that require college degrees that pay high five figures or six figures that allow you to work from home. Yeah. Those are the kinds of jobs that people can work from home. I'm so, right. I mean, there's some exceptions, but by and large, if you look at the kind of jobs that require you to have to go in versus the kind of jobs that you have to work at home, it's, it's a more upperly mobile, highly educated, more affluent, more well-resourced family that can work from home, which just makes it a little bit easier. To, if you've got a child, maybe one room over. So you combine that also with internet and all those other things you're talking about. And yeah, so that's my theory. I think it's socioeconomic. Why? Well, let, let's go on because this next point I know you're going to want to dwell on as well. And that's point number five, that a majority of those schools that went test optional or test blind during the pandemic do not expect to ever restore a standardized testing requirement in admissions. Mark, why is that? What say you? Well, you may remember Sam Prouty, who's being interviewed right now. I gave the illustration when I was talking to him before he came on the podcast, just a meeting we'd set up. And I asked him the question, uh, do you think most of these schools that are doing these tests, not the ones that say we're going test optional forever, but the ones that are doing the one or two or three year tests. And I said, do you think they're likely to restore testing or not? And he was like, remember that old rotary phone? You know, <laughs> said that's going to be testing. That's right. just a picture's worth a thousand words because I'm, you know, you and I, Dave, are old enough to remember the old rotary phone. That's right. The numbers that you cranked or even seen them in the phone booths or whatever right. before cell, cell phones became so predominant. And, and so um, um, there's certainly exceptions. I met with Yale's admission office um, recently, and they have full, every full intention, they said, to go back to requiring tests after they get through this. But it's not going to be everybody. But for some of them, it is. And this, the data's here. I mean, it's right here. It says more than two-thirds of colleges, 68%, that switched because of the pandemic say they expect to stay that way. And the number broke down to 60% of public and 79% of private. Um, and it also said the survey found that 52% of colleges changed this year. So 35% were test optional already or test blind. We've talked about it before. I mean, I think we both think that subject tests are toast <laughs> for the most part. I can see them bringing back uh, uh, the SATs and the ACTs at the highest levels. But I, I think that colleges like the flexibility to expand their thinking on these classes. And, and I think this dovetails into uh, another point. Um, well, you know what, Dave, before yeah. you mention that, yeah. the article went on to basically have a real debate on test optional, right? right? So on one side of the debate, we have the leader of the test optional movement, Robert Schaefer, yeah. executive director of Fair Test, Test National Center for Fair and Open Testing, longest critic of, you know, he's made it his crusade for multiple decades now, you know, to oppose standardized testing. And, you know, he says in the article, once admission offices experiment with ACT, SAT optional, they will see reviewing applicants as more than a score advances both their diversity and their academic quality yes. goals of their institutions. And then, you know, and that's his passion. That's his belief. And he feels very strongly about it. And then they also went to the ACT. And 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 by the way, uh, one more thing. Schaefer's urging schools to make it a two-year experiment. Try it for two years. You need sufficient data. Don't just do it one. And so that's he's urging it, you know, any school doing it one year to make it a two-year experiment. And then they went, they, they reached out to the college board, but they never got a response. But then they did reach out to the ACT and Kenton Pauls, uh, their national director of higher education, he responded um, with the opposite view, as you would expect. The, the ACT, this is how they make their money. This is their mission. And he argues the opposite way. Uh, here's a quote from him. He says, however, we expect demand for testing to remain high, even as the most well-known and outspoken test optional institutions the vast majority of the applicants actually choose to test and submit scores. Students, counselors, and families know that submitting 
test scores can serve to effectively differentiate a student's application and improve admission and scholarship prospects. So this is going to be a really ongoing debate. I'll summarize it very, very quickly. Research shows that the bo- the most accurate predictors of GPA are your grades and the curriculum that you've taken. They are the best predictors. Yeah. However, research also shows that grades, curriculum, and test scores is a better predictor than just grades and curriculum. But the argument is, but what price do we pay for having that extra indicator? Can't we make accurate decisions without it? Now we introduce tremendous class bias because all the research shows that test scores are highly correlated to the education and the income of parents. And um, and then also you're adding an incredible amounts of stress to students. And most people have proven that they're so impacted by an orderly number that it introduces a bias that keeps them from being able to properly evaluate things like character and other aspects of the file. And so there's the debate of, is it worth the extra benefit when you sort of have all the consequences? And it's not going away, Dave. It's going to continue. But we better yeah. move off this or we'll be on this topic. And, you know, it's kind of one of my hobby horses. And I can kind of <laughs> go on that one, man. <laughs> I understand. Unless you want to say something. Well, you know, and and I would just add that in the current environment, we find ourselves, especially with recent changes that everybody knows that's happening on the Supreme Court level. I think going test optional just gives colleges some more legal flexibility going forward. And I'll just, just keep it at that. I mean, I mean, it's an argument where there, there are strong points on both sides. I'll, I'll quote one more thing from Paul's of the ACT, and I can't deny this. He says, it's always important to note that great inflation has been tethered and tempered by the objectivity and stability of standardized testing. As more high school transcripts, courses, and GPAs are reviewed without the benefits of the ballast of standardized testing, it's likely to show in new ways some of the same systematic inequities and challenges. So, it, you know, it's it's going to be an ongoing debate. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and But more than anything, the point this article is making is statistics. Now, we now have concrete data to show that a lot of schools plan to stay test optional. Yep. And then I will go with uh, point number six, that colleges will increase recruitment of online students, decrease recruitment of international students, and they also showed some data that said that m- many colleges are considering taking students this year and next year that they would not have considered taking in the past. Yeah, and this is an important point because if you look at this from the standpoint of, well, what are you going to do? If you're decreasing your enrollment, you've experienced that year after year, and you're already telling me you're expecting it to continue in the future, are you prophesying your own demise? You know, are you telling me you're eventually going to be extinct or is there a plan? And and basically, they're, they're, you know, a number of them come back and kind of admit that there is a plan. Right. And one of the plans is, for a lot of them, is that we are going to have to decrease our selectivity. Right. We are going to have to take more kids than we took in the past. It's just that simple. And quite honestly, we haven't talked about that this much in the podcast, Dave, but I saw a lot of schools do this last year in this right. current 2020 class. Like they saw what was happening. They saw they were being impacted. They're going to have more summer melt. They may not have as many numbers. And they they reached down and they took a kid that they wouldn't normally take. And so one of the responses to this is we're for a certain percentage of schools and the number of, I think it was in 30 somewhere, percentage of students that they're just going to have to take more kids than they took before. And and the article closes by with something by very smart guy, David Hawkins of NACAC. He usually presides over the NACAC um, annual survey they do every year. This is a quote from him. He says, colleges will have to expand their reach to recruit students, as evidenced by their continued emphasis on recruiting transfer students. Just before we did this today, Dave, I did a yeah. session with a transfer student looking to, looking to transfer from a school in Tennessee to a school in North Carolina. Yep. Schools are going after those transfers. Um, underrepresented students. Yep. And then to me, this is the biggest possibility for them, adult learners. Yes. Adult learners and especially taking advantage of online learning. 
Online learning doesn't limit you geograph- ge- geographically, you know. You, it doesn't cost you anything to go 3,000 miles away and get a student. It says, what, what will make this task more difficult is the financial crunch that the pandemic has imposed at right. both the state and the federal level. So, you know, you have to have a plan, you know. Um, I, I always say, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So you have to have a plan. So what is the plan? And it's it's got to be more non-traditional students, underrepresented, more adult learners, more online, um, more transfer. And for some schools, decreased selectivity. If you right. were a school that took a B-plus kid, you might have to take a solid B kid. If you right. were a school that took a C-plus kid, you might have to take a C kid. It's right. either that or, you know, mergers or closures or or downsizing. Those are really your options. That's right. And to sort of put a wrap on it, uh, it was a, a sub point, but they did make the point that students who apply early will definitely be at more of an advantage since colleges in this uncertainty will be trying to lock in their students as quickly as possible. Yeah. So, so you know, not a lot of good news in the article, but mm-hmm. you know what? We want to speak truth to power and we always, our commitment to you is to keep it real. And I think you, we owe it to you to talk about trends in higher education, whether they're encouraging or not. On on the positive side, it could make it easier for your child to get into a school that they may not have gotten into before because they may have a little bit more leverage. Absolutely. Absolutely. So a very meaty article, a lot of really important points. And I think these are points that we will continue to go back to in the future, particularly as we see what's going to happen with test optional and particularly as we see schools finding new ways to expand their educational opportunities, both to online, non-traditional students, minority students, adult learners. So uh, with every single challenge, there are opportunities. So, so man, the old Dave is back, man. You, said, what? <laughs> you brought the juice today, man. This is the Dave I'm used to. Listen, I haven't asked you for a while, man. Give oh, yeah. our listeners an update with what you're seeing in the emergency room. We haven't done that in about two months. Um, are you seeing well, like what percentage are COVID? Is the emergency room back to how it used to be? Or is there kind of, use, is it, like, give us an update. It, it, it's definitely improved, but I still think that uh, it's down 25, 30% nationally. Now, part of that is online uh, had tele, telemedicine. It's definitely taken a, a, a cut out of uh, traditional ER visits, and part of those may never return. We did see a decrease in COVID that was very geographically related. So in the New York, New Jersey area and Midwest areas such as Chicago, there's definitely been a decrease. And we've seen a slight uptick, but the positivity rate has so far remained quite low. Uh, However, and not to get too far into politics, uh, there are other regions of the country that I think are experiencing a level of denialism that is being reflected in an uptick in COVID cases, particularly in Florida and Arizona. And as we enter into uh, the fall flu season, there's great trepidation as to whether we might retest some of the case highs that we saw early in March. So things are a little unsettled, Mark. We went through a period where things were looking better. But depending where you're operating, things are looking a little scary. So we shall have to wait and see. Well, you know, I love you like a brother. You know yeah. that. You're a little like a brother to me. And I'm not trying to, not trying to put you out of into business over there, you know. But every time when you talk about the growth of online medicine, I get a little smile on my face because, you know, Cause you I'm got a big... Teladoc. <laughs> yes, because, you know, I've made my Teladoc stock and... Then they purchased Lavonga and just I'm a happy camper over there. I think Teladoc stock is going to do very, very well in the future. So no one should be out of a J-O-B, but I well, kind of like this online growth in my Teladoc stock. Well, uh, during battery day, Elon Musk said that they are going to come out with a Tesla someday. That'll be twenty five thousand dollars. I can afford that Tesla. So I'm hey, looking Tesla, for- <laughs> man, we haven't heard Tesla come out of your mouth for eight weeks. Well, this, you know, the stock's been getting bashed lately. You've been quiet on it. Well, it went up 800 percent and then went down like 10 percent. So, so let's just say if you're holder holder of a Tesla stock, I still think you're smiling. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Now it's time for our step by step walk through of the college admissions process.
It sounds like you had a crazy weekend. Yes. What, tell me about your weekend. It was just chock full of natural fun. <laughs> <laughs> One minute you're doing some football thing with Johnny, then you're at the auto zone. I was like a ping pong ball trying to keep track of like what you had going on this weekend. Oh, all kinds of fun activity. But you know what? Happy Monday because we are up early, early, Mark. Early, oh, early. I, I'm almost early. forgetting who's the, the morning person. Is it me or is it you? You know something? You're partly one of the ones who converted me into this. <laughs> and I'm coming I'm getting, to you. <laughs> I've been getting up at 5 a.m. lately. <sighs> yeah. We're doing a 7 a.m. recording. Mm. Monday morning, three days before you guys hear it. And so, uh, you ready to dive on in? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so we are in Chapter 141, a book I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked. College admissions questions, and we're looking at endowment today. What is endowment? What's the significance of endowment? Um, and I'm about to roll out a super corny illustration, so we'll see if it works. But I'll let you take share your takeaways from the chapter, Nika. Okay, so we know that endowments are important. I think we've known that. Um, you do emphasize mostly about the private colleges and how this is mostly important for them because, you know, they... And obviously, they only they don't get as much government funding, um, Correct. which honestly, I, I wonder if it's the same now for public institutions. I mean, do you or do would you suggest that public schools? Well, uh, I, well, let me just let me just dive a little bit further into it because I do have a, a question or two for you. Yeah, I do want to talk about that, but I think you need to define endowment because not everybody yeah. knows. Yeah, so basically, it's this philanthropic fund. Um, it's managed by you know, I guess, uh, financial professionals that do all the investment activity. And where the principal of the fund is kept, but around 5% of it is used annually where it can, well, I guess it can be drawn down from the fund annually to go towards the school's operating budget. And it can right. be used for things like faculty, salaries, benefits, and most importantly, I think, is financial. Well, I shouldn't say most importantly, but just as importantly is financial aid because I know students can get money from that. And that's what we're mostly talking about. Um, and, and what's interesting is that I'm learning about endowments as I work through them, you know, in my own job in terms of. How right. I figured you'd have some interaction with endowments and your, yeah. in your alumni capacities there. Mm -hmm. So where you have all of these thou, well, we no, not into the thousands yet, but, uh, you know, that's our aspiration. You have all of these funds, hundreds and hundreds, you know, some people have thousands and thousands of all these different funds, mm -hmm. um, that are provided by donors, like donors right. establish these endowments. Yeah. And most times the donors, or all the times I should say probably, mm -hmm. is that they have restriction on that. I want the funds right. to go toward this or I want the for funds to not go toward that. Um, and I think the uh, the clear thing here is that the bigger the fund, the bigger the endowment, um, the more the school can invest in your child, can invest in your family. Um, but again, I do want to go back to the point you were making about the private institutions, because I do know working at a public institution, how important it is for us to. So I just want to, you know, bring that out to the. No, uh, like, no. So one of the things that's been happening, and we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, sometimes with you and Nika, sometimes with Dave, is, is how increasingly states are, you know, allocating less and less and less money to public institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a 40 year trend. Um, that's been happening. It really started happening significantly initially under Reagan, and it's just continued and continued. And it really, you know, was exacerbated in the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, and it's going to inevitably, you know, take a whole nother level with what we're experiencing right now. So basically, you know, states are in a tough position as they have less money in their coffers. And so it's a lot easier for them to to allocate money to other sources, especially other sources uh, that are perceived as more urgent. The thing about higher ed is there's always the thinking that students can take a loan so you can pass the costs on to the parents, where that's not an option, even, for example, in like K-12 schools and certainly, mm -hmm. you know, other things, whether it's like roads, bridges, polices, you know, building projects, hospitals, some of these other pension funds, some of these other things that take up a lot of money for, you know, for states. So it's an easy place to make cuts. And so what's happened in, you know, the last, especially the last 10 years, is public schools have said, we got to play the game the private schools have played. Because mm -hmm. the private schools, knowing they haven't had that government money, have always put a huge priority on raising their endowments. So they're not completely tuition dependent as a source of money. And so that's one thing that you're really seeing right now is an increased emphasis on public schools at recruiting out of state as a way of getting more money, recruiting internationally. 
as a way of getting more tuition dollars, but also raising their endowments. Is that your question or did I just jump ahead and read your mind or try to read your mind? No, no, no. That That is exactly it. I mean, and it was it's more so not necessarily a question, it was just a statement because, again, the, the chapter focuses on the private institutions and how it drives, you know, how they're, you know, how they're able to recruit, you know, top talent and all that stuff. Um, but I just know, again, in experience, I just know that's becoming increasingly important for everyone, as you just mentioned. So, yes, you did underscore that point. And there are a few public schools that have big endowments. There are a couple. Mm-hmm. The oh, University yeah. of Texas system, uh, both like UT Austin as well as Texas A&M. I mean, they have crazy money and so does the University of Michigan. Um, and the University of Virginia has got quite a bit of money, a lot of money. So there are a few public schools that have been playing this game for a while. But if you look at the largest endowments, especially endowment for a student, it's overwhelmingly dominated by your private schools. You know, there's just a couple exceptions. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that $5,000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. All right. So I'm going to try, attempt an illustration to see if we can really make this endowment concept resonate. So you can, you can, you know, one thing I know about you, you'll be honest with me. <laughs> you can let me know if it flops. I saw yours in a chapter. I wonder if you're going to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, slightly kind of, kind of, sort of, slightly different. So yeah. this is a scenario. So you have this 67-year-old dad, um, and he's got a pretty successful business. Unfortunately, he gets hit by COVID-19, and he passes away. Dies at 68. But what he does is he gives a million dollars to each of his two kids. Okay. He's got twin daughters, you know, they're 35 years old. So now they each get a million dollars. And there's a stipulation in there that it has to be invested in an annuity that kicks off 5%. And so you can't touch the principal. So that a million dollars at 5% kicks $50,000 into each of their annual budgets. So they're going to now get $50,000 per year, each of these, each of these daughters that he has into their operating budget, their expenses for their daily living. So several things I want to say about this. One of the twins has one child, or another one has seven kids. So this is a big difference, right? The one can now spend $50,000 on their one child. They can do a lot of enrichment with that. There may be private school. You know, there may be a college fund. That may be traveling around the world. The other one has to split it Seven kids, it's about 7000 per kid. Still a lot of money, but it's a big difference between $50,000 for one kid versus 7000 And the reason I use that example is because when you look at endowment, you need to look at endowment per student. People just look at overall endowment. But you really need to look at endowment per student because that's really the best benchmark. And so there's a big difference between saying, you can't just say you've got 50000 No, you got 50000 for one kid versus 50000 for seven kids. That money can go a lot further. So that's why you look at endowment per student. Secondly, I'm stretching my illustration. I'm just going with this thing. You know, do you, do you put the brakes on me? <laughs> so in one, in the case of one of the twin daughters, there's a lot of different restrictions in there. 
So for example, they both get 50,000, but in one it says, you know, a portion of this money has to be used for college. A portion of this money has to be used for summer camps. A portion of this money has to be used to go overseas and travel. And so what that does is it restricts the freedom of the parent to use that money on wherever they need it to put that money. They might want it. Maybe they do want to put their kid in a private school, but oh no, that's like restricted for college. That's like restricted for camps. That's restricted for overseas travel. And that's the way endowments also work in the real world, where ideally the best benchmark to really compare endowments is endowments per student. However, depending on what you said, Anika, earlier, what restrictions the donors have put on the money, it really can inhibit the ability of the school to just have unrestricted money in their operating budget to use wherever they want to plug holes, you know, in their school. And, and that's the way it is. Now, you know, you said thousands. So when I worked in boarding school, my very first year I did, I was director of annual giving. So I had to raise money. That was my job. And I remember this. We had 976 different endowed funds, mm. you know, and that was over 20 years ago. But that's exactly to, close to 20 years, exactly 20 years, actually. You know, and so we had all this money in the endowment. It's like over $100 million, but it had 976 different funds that the money had to go to. Um, and even my own case, I think I told you this, Nika, that I've given money to like a private school that both my kids went to and in an endowed fund, but it's restricted. It's like 50000 It's like the CARES Fund and a Joy Fund for both of them. I haven't given it all yet. It's like a pledge that I give every year I give to complete the pledge. But the school knows. Like we had to go back and forth on the on the terms. They had to satisfy what terms as a donor I wanted that money to go to. And so that's just, that's not just like money that they can just use any way they want. Like one fund is explicitly for kids that have never had an overseas study abroad experience. And they're under-resourced. So like Karis is really into travel. So we want it to take a kid that's never been out of the country and give them like a, like a mission trip to another country. And the other fund in the joy fund is for someone that basically is struggling to stay in the school. They're, it looks like they're going to have to leave because they don't have the money. It's like a, basically it's like an emergency fund for someone that has a crisis and they can't pay tuition. And so that's, those are the conditions that we went back and forth for like two or three months working on the language, getting it tight. So that's sort of how, that's exactly how colleges work. They have these funds that the donors stipulate and it does hinder the freedom and the flexibility of the school to put the money wherever they want. But at the same time, they'd rather have it than not have it. This is a good thing. So of course they're going to accept it, but it's the donor who's giving it. So the donor gets to say uh, what the money's going to go for as long as it's consistent with the school's mission. So I've said a lot there. Any comments? Mm, no, I think, first of all, excellent il- illustration. Really? <laughs> Great job. That's two in a row. Remember, two you liked the one that I had about the allowance that the kids got? <laughs> great, great. Because it's stay on a roll, Mark. I'm stay on a roll. <laughs> two for two. So, but, you know, but I, I just kind of think if I take it down, it down to the family level mm-hmm. and, and, you know, then somebody can understand it a little bit better. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, you take that $50,000, let's say one Let's say those two kids, let's say they, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to push my illustration so bad that you're going to say, oh, okay, I take it back. <laughs> Very stop on my head. But, you know, but let, let's say, let's say, you know, one of them made 50000 in terms of from their job. It's a big difference between having an extra fifty coming in versus 50000 is what you make. And the 50000 that they make is a reflection of the tuition that a school gets. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is why a school that's just dependent on tuition is completely in a different position than a school that's got a large endowment. There's a big difference between having 100000 in your budget versus 50000 off your earnings. Right. You know, you can do all kinds of different things. And, you know, you mentioned mostly financial aid. I wouldn't only prioritize financial aid. There are a lot of things important, like the faculty, faculty, mm-hmm. your ability to pay faculty well, mm-hmm. to have endowed faculty chairs. You can have like a superstar faculty that's paid for and covered. You can use endowments for study abroad. You can use endowment for emergency funds, for hospitals, for all kinds of things. Anyway, mm-hmm. I'm on a roll. I'm trying <laughs> to be on a roll. But it's all good, though. All good. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but I guess the, the one thing we haven't really talked about is how we tap mm-hmm. into, like, how does a family tap into an endowment? Like, oh, they say, okay, we heard about the money's there, but how do families normally access it? And from, again, the only way that I know through is through applying for very specific scholarship awards. 
Obviously, you know, the operating budget is ran by the university. They use money, whatever, whatever. But that's pretty much it on how we access those funds, right? Well, yeah, but but here's the thing. You know, all of that money gets poured into resources that go for the student. So you mm-hmm. may not see that a large part of, part of that endowment was allocated toward faculty compensation. You don't see that as a student. That's invisible. Oh, right, right, right. But, yeah. but what you experience is the ability to sit under the tutelage of some of the most renowned scholars in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, in the chapter, we didn't talk too much about the chapter, but in the chapter, I show the average pay at schools with really high endowments for professors. And you'll see that's over $200,000, you know, mm-hmm. per, per, you know, per year. That's because it's the kind of money that they have. You know, versus there's other places where professors are making forty thousand. So, which, which place do you think is going to attract the top talent? The place that pays like two thirty for a professor, or the place that pays forty. Right. You know, so like, so sometimes you don't see the benefits, like as a parent or as a student, that may seem invisible, but they're definitely there. Mm-hmm. So anyway, all right. I'm trying to avoid the two hour episode, so we got to move on. I think we got it. <laughs> I'm just happy that I passed the Anika illustration test. That's a high bar. <laughs> yeah, tough grader. You're, you're the professor. Right. I would have. I would have avoided. Oh, that that's she doesn't give A's. She only gives B's and B minuses. I'm not taking her yeah, class. I would have. I would have been that professor. I know. I, I know you were. You don't need to tell me anything. I don't know. <laughs> that's why if I can get a B plus out of you, I'm ready to do a cartwheel. B minus. B minus. Okay. See, <laughs> see, I give you a compliment. You take it back. And now for the question. <laughs> it's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, this week's question comes from Suzanne. Suzanne is a college counselor in Oregon. Hey, Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne, Suzanne. says, love your show and listen to it weekly. Thank you very much, sweet. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. I've been serving as an early college advisor for the past 10 years in Oregon. Families always ask if the credits will transfer to another college or university. My answer is always, it depends on the income in school. Can you please do an episode on how colleges look at high school students who are enrolled in dual credit programs? How does dual enrollment and dual credit compare to IB and AP programs? So I love this question because honestly, this is a question in the back of my mind. I was thinking, you know, we probably need to talk a little bit more about this, how colleges see dual enrollment or dual credit, which are used, you know, interchangeably. In the Southeast, they tend to say dual enrollment. Other parts of the country, they say dual credit. Um, that was going to be one of my admissions vernaculars, but I guess we, we stole that one there. And so um, I've been wanting to talk about this. For a while. And so this question was, was great. So first of all, let me say, Suzanne is absolutely correct. There are so many custom individualized approaches out there that the responsible answer for any college counselor is to say, check the policy of the colleges that you are considering and read the fine print. So that's the first thing I want to say. There's such wide variance out there that that is a responsible answer. Check the policy, read the fine print. Now you think, how do you check the policy? Well. There are a lot of ways to do it, but I encourage you to start with just putting the name of the college into Google and and put dual enrollment transfer credit policy. That's what I find is the best way to get there. There's other things. You can put dual credit. You can put APIB credit policy because normally this is in the same section as their AP and IB credit policy as well. You know, that's something we've touched on, but we haven't talked about that much, Anika, that every school has their own policy. When it comes to AP scores and IB scores hmm. and what they're going to give credit for, and that varies school, not only school by school, it varies course by course often. Oh, wow. So it's normally all in the same section on their website. So that's where you want to go to find out what the policy is. So that would be the second point I would make. The third point I would make is that this is in, in general, in general, public schools are much more open to respecting dual credits. Um, even flagship schools than selective private schools, which tend to be a lot more suspect. And so let's, let's look at, let's use my own daughters. Oftentimes our own kids make the best illustrations. So Karis and Joy, they, uh, my two kids, you know, 24, 21, Karis went to a selective private school. 
Joy went to flagship public school, or she's still a senior at University of Georgia. So both kids had five courses of dual enrollment in high school. Each of them did. And for Joy, it, it enabled her to come in with more than a half a year of college credit because, you know, really all the public schools in the state of Georgia and most around the country respect dual enrollment, dual credit, and they will allow you to have college credit when you come in. However, Davidson College, where Harris went, this is exactly what it says. I looked, went to their website talking about dual enrollment. The course can, can't have been used to meet the requirements for graduation from a high school. So they have a policy that says you can't get credit for both high school courses and college courses off of dual enrollment. And I looked up the other, the most selective schools that are within five hours of Atlanta. Besides Davidson, the three most selective would be Davidson, Emory, and Vanderbilt. All three, the same thing. Vanderbilt, I'm reading right from their website. Vanderbilt does not offer, and they put in bold, dual enrollment credit under most circumstances. If the course in question appears on both the high school transcript and the college transcript, the school will receive credit only one time. And then Emory says the same thing. Emory has a policy. 18 credit hours is the most that you can get um, coming in. Um, 12 from AP and IB. That's the maximum, which is similar to Davidson. They have a four credit max in terms of their policy. And then it goes on to say college course credit except where the credit has already counted toward the high school diploma. So what most selective, highly selective private schools do is they won't let you double count dual enrollment credit for high school and for college. But in general, in general, public schools don't have that policy. But the bottom line is to check each individual school and to see what their what their policy is. So I just want to stop for a second, and you guys, a few more things I want to say. And and then Suzanne had a part two to her question. But any thoughts, comments, you know, opinions, questions, anything so far? So I do. I just wonder about this because I do have a couple of friends whose kids have gone through that dual enrollment program. And, I, and one actually is in there now. And I wonder, and I know that they're not necessarily looking at colleges that accept or they don't, you know, that's not on their radar right now. So mm-hmm. what are the, what could be the benefits of dual, en- dual enrollment if you get to a school that doesn't accept it? Like, is there a benefit? Are there any benefits to it? Yeah, there are actually a lot of benefits. Great question. So uh, one of the things I love, love, love about dual enrollment um, is your opportunity to be on a college campus and get to experience what that college life is like. Now, not all dual enrollment um, courses are taught on the college campus. Uh, Increasingly, more and more high schools are offering them right in their high school setting. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah, you'll find both models. But I love it when you're on the college campus because, uh, you know, you just get used to that environment, the Mm -hmm. freedom of that environment and how much you have to manage your own course load and being around older kids and just that exposure to that culture helps transition when you go into that culture because you've had some exposure to that culture. So I think it's, it's an accelerant and when it comes to helping your ability to transition to college because you got to, you got to sort of try college light. If that mm-hmm. makes any, if that makes any sense, even if you're not living in the dorms and you know all that's involved in that kind of thing. Right. Um, another thing is, it can be a great way for you to maybe put your little toe in the water and test out and see whether or not a particular major uh, is something you might be interested in in college mm-hmm. by trying okay. some courses that are not offered at your high school. You know, um, mm-hmm. and that's really a third point is you get exposure to a much wider range of courses to pick and choose and select from oftentimes than what your own high school offers. So that's it. And then, and then depending on the school, I mean, it is seen as a more rigorous class usually than a typical high school class. So for example, mm. in the state of Georgia, you know, we have something called Georgia Student Finance Commission that manages our Hope Scholarship and our Zell Miller program. And they will give you um, a 0.5 more for a dual enrollment or an AP or an IB. So they'll see those as r- rigorous classes that, you know, that add to your weighted GPA. Oh, okay. And even if you have other, other systems that may not function exactly that way, it is perceived as a more rigorous course than just an average 
high school class. So it sort of adds to the your rigor. Gotcha. Um, any thoughts on any of those? Do those make some sense? No, actually, I was thinking about that earlier. So you reminded me because I did wonder if the evaluator of an app, let's just say you are being holistically reviewed, mm-hmm. if that would just be seen as, you know, a, a strengthening, you know, a strength mm-hmm. factor in your application, period, you know, just it overall. Is. Yeah. And and I also want to underscore. So when I talk about the colleges that tend not to double count you and say you can't get co- high school and college credit both off of a dual enrollment class. Um, that's a very, very, very small slice of the college universe. Like, you know, we, we can't say enough, Anika, these highly selective private schools, they're a very small sliver of the overall college universe. Like they're under 5%. They may be under 2%, 3%. So, so keep in mind, the vast majority of colleges will give you college credit, mm. you know, so college credit normally does apply. It's just that it won't apply for certain schools. And I just think it's important to keep in perspective that we're talking about a very, very small portion of the schools out there that it won't count for. Mm, Okay. All right. So let's take up part two of of Suzanne's question, because this is a completely different question. And I'm going to be completely transparent in my answer. So, So Suzanne also asks, how does dual enrollment, or how does enrollment in dual credit compare to IB and AP? And this question actually presents a real dilemma for colleges. Because on the one hand, if you listen to colleges, now I'm talking about highly selective colleges, ones that do holistic admissions. On the one hand, you'll hear them say, we look at you through the context of your high school. And we don't compare student at high school A compared to high school B. Because you can only do what you have offered to you. So under that rationale, if that's what your school is offering, dual enrollment, you know, as as your advanced offering, then it should absolutely be treated no different than AP or IB. That's mm-hmm. all that your school could offer. And you took the absolute best curriculum that your school could offer. And certainly there are, no question, there are some colleges, even the most selective colleges, that will look at it that way. However, on the other hand, let me give you the other argument, and I'll tell you what sort of college admissions officers will say amongst themselves or if they're completely transparent a lot of times. So we know that admissions is about risk and reward, right? What's the risk versus what is the reward? What's the upside versus what are the risk factors? And when you're assessing an applicant academically and you're looking at the risk and the reward, if you're a really selective school, then you want to see how did someone handle the most demanding curriculum? Did they handle it and do well or did they not? And here's the bottom line. I'm just going to tell you, the most selective schools, they tend to respect IB and AP more than they do dual credit or dual enrollment as far as the rigor of the course. They just do. And especially if you are in an AP class and you're getting fours and fives on tests, or you're in an IB class and you're getting sixes and sevens on, um, you may remember this, Anika, IB has higher level and standard level courses. You're getting like six and seven and higher level courses in IB and fours and fives in APs compared to just going and taking a dual credit or dual enrollment class a more selective college will have more confidence in your ability that you've proven to them that you can handle higher level work based on what you've done in AP or IB. Why do you think that would be true? I I wonder if it's just because they've just been around for so long. (laughs) I mean, is is it just more reputable to them? Uh, I don't know. Is that it? Is it just because? No, you know know what it is? And I'm going to be completely honest. I don't blame them. It, It said it's more standardized. So like, okay. you know what you're getting yeah. when someone's okay, been in an sense. IB, you know what that course is, you know, the level of the rigor and you know what it means, particularly if there's a score there, you know how much somebody's mastered the curriculum. But when it comes to like, you don't know every single college curriculum out here, mm-hmm. you like some of them are not that challenging. Mm. They're just not. And, and so there's that trust because you're familiar with it and you know what it stands for, you know, and I really have to say, I know this might sound elitist, but I really don't blame them because I know so many colleges that offer dual enrollment that are substantially easier than an AP or an IB course would be. Mm, wow. I, I see it. I see people go to, I'm not naming the schools, but you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have some people mad at me, <laughs> but, but they're in my head. <laughs> mm. I can assure you, you know, and, and I see students go in and they take those courses and that student would die in like an AP calc or an AP physics or something like that. And so I can understand why colleges have more 
respect for you proving your rigor to them if you've done it in an IB or an AP. Now, once again, I can't say this enough. Every situation can vary. Like, like there can be very rigorous, demanding dual enrollment courses and an admission officer that's really getting to know that area really well and farming their territory. They can find that out and they can put a little, you know, a little asterisk and say, look, this school here, this brings, they bring the heat. Hmm. But what I see is tremendous variance um, with dual enrollment classes. And I see some that just quite honestly, they do not match up for the rigor of an IB and or an AP. So I understand why a college would sort of say that. Well, most of the time they won't say it because you, do you see the dilemma they have? Like they're mm-hmm. saying, we're not, we're going to judge you only by what opportunities you have. Right. So right. if we come in and say, we prefer AP or IB, and then, then you're going to make somebody feel really bad. And they say, well, my school doesn't offer a lot of that. So what are you saying about me? Am I just chopped liver? But yeah. I mean, are you saying that I don't have the same options as as Joe Blow across the street at well at well resourced privilege high? So do high schools offer all three? Sometimes, but not always. Ah, it's, you I didn't know, know that. Okay. Sometimes they offer all three, but sometimes they you know they don't. Now, what I'm seeing is a big trend for a lot of schools to start to offer more dual enrollment because one of the nice things about dual enrollment. Because most public schools give you credit automatically, that it's a way of almost guaranteeing your kids that they'll come in with college credit. Mm. Whereas with AP, you don't get college credit just because you took an AP course. You have to prove mastery of it by acing the exam. Right. Where usually with dual credit, dual enrollment, a lot of times you just need to get a C in the class. Mm. And, you get, and you get credit for that, just like college credit oh, at wow. most public schools. So it's a much easier way to almost guarantee students that you'll come in with college credit already. Mm-hmm. So it's very popular for that reason in a lot of places and growing. Like you hear so much more about dual enrollment, dual credit. I do now than I heard even five years ago and 10 or 15 years ago, there was not all this dual enrollment. I need to see actual stats. I guarantee you if I was to see the stats, the growth in dual enrollment, like now compared to a decade ago, mm-hmm. it would be astronomical. Hmm. Okay. It's kind of smart. Like, I mean, if you want to come in with some college credit and save on the cost of college or the time in college, it's a great idea. It's a great way to do it while you still get exposure to college. Okay. I, I can tell you it's a lot easier than going in and trying to get fours and fives on APs or six and sevens on IVs. Hmm. Any thoughts, Anika? No, I just, we, we never went down that dual enrollment lane. And honestly, I didn't know really anything about it until pretty later on, you know, as Jalen and Janae were nearing college, but, um, or at least high school, at least. So, yeah. Well, both your kids went to boarding schools, yeah. you know, in, in the mid Atlantic, you know, and they're still mostly working off of an IB or AP model. Right. You know, you'll find it mostly emphasized in public schools. Although certainly you're finding more and more private schools that are doing it as well, including the ones my kids went to. Hmm, okay. Now the one my kids went to, they had AP or dual enrollment. They had both. Interesting. All right. Well, good luck, Suzanne, on your kiddos. Yep. Good luck, Suzanne. Appreciate. Keep listening to every episode. We love Oregon listeners. <laughs> and now this week's interview with a special guest. Fantastic. I'm actually going to ask you a question about the admission, pro- not, not so much the admission process, but what you look for. So, you know, everyone's looking for a good student, right? And everyone's a strong student, strong academic student. Everyone's looking for a good citizen, someone who will comport themselves well, someone who will get along well with everybody. And everyone's looking for someone who will make contributions outside the classroom somehow to the community, whether it's student government, athletics, arts, you know, <clears throat> community service. What would be some things besides good student, good citizen, and someone who will plug in and we can maybe see a place or two where they've demonstrated some commitment and passion in high school, and we can see where they'll make some contributions on our campus that you look for in the admission process? So my father-in-law once told me that a computer could do my job because all you need to do is program an Excel spreadsheet, take the highest... (laughs) scores and the highest GPAs, and then you're done. And, and I tried to explain to him why I'm still a useful person, and he doesn't see it. But um, 
but I want your listeners to know this, right? Who you are absolutely matters to colleges. And, and not to sound snobby, but at a very selective school, you know, lots of people have all A's and we, we have now gone test optional, but before we did, lots of kids had really great scores. Um, you know, I want to read the essay that makes me laugh or that makes me cry or that makes me think. I want to read a teacher recommendation that not only says you did the work and you did it well, but you were a catalyst for the learning of others in, in the classroom, or you were the one who stayed after every time because you were just, you know, you're just frothing at the mouth with curiosity about history or math or whatever the thing is that you're studying. Um, I want to see not only, you know, are you the captain of the team or the leader of the band and all of that, you know, that's great, but I want to see a passion, right? I mean, if you're, if your thing is, you know, uh, trail maintenance in the woods, you know, that you don't get a captainship uh, letter for that. But that if that's your thing, if that's what you're passionate about, then I want to know about it. And I want to I want to feel that passion come through. And so um, I want to assure everybody out there that a grade and a number is not what schools like ours are looking for. We're really you know, I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know how you see your place in the world. I want to know what makes you think. I want to know what makes you mad. Um, These are the things I think that really help us figure out who the students are that we want to admit sort of above and beyond just this kid is wicked smart and really involved. That was really a plus. You nailed that one. That was good. Cause so many times students, um, you know, they think it's just about GPA, you know, and it's just, we're so much more than GPA, you know, and on the academic side and, and even on the character side, they don't realize the little things that being interesting, being unique and all these different things and how they add to a, community and how you're trying to assemble a class. That's right. You know, and, you know, and, and you're looking at, wow, this student could add this to the class. Here's the thing, listeners, you are not only going to be a student, you're going to be somebody's roommate. You're going to be on a team. You're going to be in the orchestra or a play. You're going to do community service, maybe at the school that my own kids go to. You're going to plug into the town. At Middlebury, we have a very high percentage of our graduates who wind up finding their future spouse here at Middlebury, right? So my job and our, the job of our team is not just to admit a really smart kid. I'm, we're, we're, you know, I'm helping you find your spouse. I'm going to try to find you a really good spouse. <laughs> I'm going to try to find you a really good roommate. Uh, and, and we take that seriously. You know, the, the person that you are and what you bring to the table far beyond your GPA absolutely matters to us. That's good. That's really good. What What are the things Middlebury needs to work on to take its take its game to the next level? Talking athletically, to to be even a better school. You know, I think part of what we need to do is is we need to help the world understand that the liberal arts and sciences are still as relevant as they always were. Um, you know, I think that we live in a very pre professional world right now, and you know, uh, how much money am I going to make when I'm 22? Um, and that's important. And, you're, and you know what? I have news for you out there, students. If you're smart and work hard, you're going to be just fine and you're going to be able to pay your rent. Um, but I think, you know, education for a life, education to make you an interesting person and to make you an engaged member of your community, that's still wicked important. That's really, really important. Um, so I, I, we need to help the world understand that, that the liberal arts make you whole. I think specifically, you know, Middlebury is always looking to diversify. Um, we are fairly diverse. We're quite diverse in, in terms of economics, politics, race, background, geography, but there's always room to be better. Uh, and the truth is we are not as diverse as we would like to be in all of those ways. Uh, and we're probably not as diverse as schools that are, you know, 10 minutes outside of a metropolis. And so that is certainly something we're always, uh, we're always working on. Um, I think that we need to make sure that, um, you know, and I have COVID in mind right now, right, as our students are perhaps not on campus and they've had to do some remote learning. Um, we obviously need to make sure that the quality of that community is always at the forefront of our attention. I, I think it is. Um, and, and recent months have, have challenged us to make sure that, you know, even if you're conducting your life via Zoom, are you still plugged in? Do you have access to the resources and the people that you need? And, you know, put I'll put my bias on the table. I think that's where small schools really shine is when, you know, when trouble hits, if we if we have an emergency, if we've had to send students home or what have you, are they still really plugged in? Are they still tuned in? And, uh, you know, I think that's a great litmus test. But, you know, we're always thinking about that. We're certainly thinking about diverse sets of voices and backgrounds and experiences here. 
let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, if you want to get federal money for college, you're going to have to complete the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. This applies to the Federal Direct Student Loan Program, which is not income specific. The wealthiest person in the world could tap that 2.75% loan if they want. Uh, The Pell Grant, FSCOG. But there are other things as well, like many colleges will dispense their own institutional money based on completing the FAFSA. But you don't want to be like 30 to 35% based on studies and make a mistake on the FAFSA. That's what statistics show. One out of three people make a mistake on the FAFSA. And those mistakes can be very costly. So in order to avoid that, I recommend a really good FAFSA walkthrough that takes you step-by-step, line-by-line through the FAFSA. And the best one out there this year is, once again, we go to Utah, Utah's Higher Educational Assistance Authority, UHEAA, has a great 2021-22 FAFSA walkthrough. Step-by-step, line-by-line, it's 40 minutes long, and it's on YouTube, and it's our recommended resource for episode 41. We'll put the link in the show notes. We'll now return to the final segment of my interview with Sam Prouty. So that's this has been fantastic, Sam. First of all, thanks for what you did about, about remote schools and thought that was very, very, very compelling. And I think you've been done a really good job of answering uh, my questions about Middlebury and questions I think a lot of our listeners have. But I warned you, nobody gets off our podcast without going on the hot seat. We call it the lightning round. It's mostly okay. non-school stuff, non-college stuff. It's like peeling back the onion and getting to know Sam the person. You ready? Okay, let's go. So you mentioned you like cars before. So let's say... Uh, you won a lottery ticket that said you could get any car in the world. Money was a non-issue. What would you get? I would get an old Saab 900 because I think they're crazy and quirky and different. And my parents always had them and uh, you can't get them like that anymore. So the good news is you don't need a lottery. You just need you, you need a small lottery. <laughs> so they don't cost a, an arm and a leg. They're just hard to find. That's true. <laughs> if, secondly, if you were not in Education at all. So no teaching, no college counseling, no admissions, completely different profession and career. What would it be? I wanted to be an actor when I was young. So if I could somehow have a guarantee that I could put food on the table, uh, I would probably try to do that. Or I would write for an automotive magazine. Oh, so that writing passion has continued to stay with you. You haven't lost it. I haven't lost that. What's the biggest lesson you've learned in life? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'll be schmaltzy and say that my kids my kids have taught me all kinds of lessons that I didn't know before I had them. But I will also say, and this, this does connect to, to work. It's okay. I, I love people's stories. And I think, I, you know, I grew up in a very homogenous place. I did not know many people of color. I didn't know many Jewish people. I didn't know many gay people, et cetera. And I think having done the job that I've done for 20 years and just knowing Every, everybody out there has a story, and that has taught me so much about the different ways that people walk through the world. And I'm just so grateful that, that I, I chose a profession that has allowed me to do that. You know, I, I feel like every year I get older, I just know a little more about, about how people navigate the world. Nice, nice. I love it. What's the guilty pleasure food? You know it's not healthy, but you eat it anyway. Potato chips. I could, I could oh. put away more bags of potato chips in one sitting than I care to admit. <laughs> Oh boy, you hit my weakness. <laughs> Potato chips and I like um, a certain kind of cinnamon candy, cinnabear candy. But yeah, now they've got the new kettle one. Well, they're not new anymore. They're probably like 10 years out, but I like them even more than the old ones. <laughs> and the hot barbecue too for me, both of them. If you combine something sweet, so a chocolate bar, something with some sugar in it with the saltiness of a potato chip, absolute heaven right there. <laughs> there you go. All right, this is a tough one. I used to ask our guests, what's the best book they've ever read? But it was just too hard. So now I'm asking, what's the best book you've read in the last five years? St- still probably hard. That's a real, uh, gosh, that's a, just a really, really hard one. Um, <laughs> the hot seat's supposed to be hard. The hot seat is supposed to be hard. How about a good book? It doesn't have to be the best book. Well, I'll tell you, I'm a huge Tom Petty fan. And when Tom Petty died, I read his biography. And I encourage anybody to read the biography of, of the artist that you love, because 
knowing something about their life story affects and, and improves how much you can appreciate their art. So go out and read a great mm. biography. There you go. There you go. I like it. How do you relax? I hike or ski or in some other way, get outside. Yeah. Well, that's good mental health. That's true for all of us, especially the way we've been feeling cooped in as of late. And then my last question of the day, your best advice to students and your best advice to parents. Students, um, this is your process, so own it. It's, mo- it's mostly about you. It's not about me. It's not about the college that I work for, right? This is a process that's about you and figuring yourself out and what you need and, what, and the person that you want to become and how can my school help you. So don't make the mistake of thinking that the college process is about colleges. It's about you. Parents, I say this with love, uh, take a back seat. This is, your, this is your child's process. It's not yours. It's not about where you went to school. It's not about what schools were like when you applied 30 years ago. Um, so my best advice to parents is ask your children really great questions, but don't give them the answers as you see them. Yeah, and another way of, you know, don't try not to let your ego get in the way of your kids having the opportunity to pursue what they want to do. So that's easier said than done, but good stuff. Good stuff. Sam, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on here. And I have a really big announcement to make. I'm really excited about it. Sam has agreed to do a one-hour Zoom session just for our listeners. Uh, I'll be working on the date and time with him and announcing it well in advance. And you can come on and ask him about Middlebury. You can ask him about college admissions. It's just your opportunity to have some one-on-one time with Sam and Our listeners include students, parents, and college counselors. So thanks, Sam. I really, really appreciate it. I know our listeners are going to love an hour of one-on-one time with you. So I greatly thank you for that. Well, and I thank you, Mark, for this and for doing what you do to help people understand this process. And I can't wait to meet some of you, perhaps uh, more in person in that Zoom session. Sounds great. And then maybe on campus after that. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Visaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stallianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us and we'll include them on the show, you can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.